Hello, I'm Mickey Granot, and I'm welcoming you to another session of NextEra Academy, Bar Theory of Constraints. This time, we will focus on the concept of buffers. Uh, we have already introduced some background about the theory of constraints, a little bit about the key processes of theory of constraints, the focusing process, and the process of ongoing improvement. But one of the key components that differentiate theory of constraints from any other system is the concept of buffers. Uh, so let's try to understand. As a background, every organization has a goal, or at least should have a goal. Uh, and in order to achieve this organization, uh, sorry, in order to achieve this goal, any organization needs to do something, to execute something, to produce, to distribute, to buy and sell, to provide a service, or any other thing. Uh, any goal is reachable only in the future, and the future carries uncertainty. These are just a few statements about organizations and systems in general terms, uh, but they are setting the framework for our discussion about buffers. Some of the organizational practices. To enable the organizations to achieve the goal, uh, two key managerial practices are involved, the planning and the execution. The planning is all the processes that the management is taking in order to decide beforehand what needs to be done in the future so that the objective or the goals of the system are achieved. Uh, it is a means to decide in advance what are the resources and uh, uh, investments and actions required so that in the future the company can achieve its goal. Once there is a plan, the next phase of the company or the organization is to execute the plan, is to take practical actions to convert the plan into tasks, missions, and to execute them uh, so that the objectives are achieved. This is just a simple practice, common practice that needs to be done. However, there are some fundamental uh, difficulties or challenges with these two key processes. So frequently, frequently, more often than not, the execution does not adhere to the plan. Uh, and uh, when this happens, the common explanation management is using is Murphy. Murphy is blamed for setting the rule that if anything can go wrong, it will. Uh, and it enables us to say, although we have planned, the reality had surprises in it we could not plan for. And because of these surprises, we could have not adhered to the plan from one inside. And most, even worse than that, we could have not achieved the objectives or the goals we set forth for the plan. And it doesn't matter what plan we are talking about, whether it is a strategic plan or any operational plan under the strategic plan of any organization. Um, so there are two things that need to be understood in this sense. One is that, well, it should not be a surprise that the future carries uncertainty. This is by definition. So we would expect that as companies and people learn from experience, they are able to better be prepared to the fact that the future carries uncertainty. And the second one, which is kind of uh, uh, a common approach is that when they, there is difficulty in executing the existing plan, the common practice is to prepare a new plan. Uh, what would be different in the new plan? It will still be for the future. The future will still carry uncertainty and there will still be obviously a reality where the plan cannot be adhered to and the objectives cannot be attained. So it is not a surprise that there is uncertainty in the future, uh, but when you observe the planning practices of organizations, it seems that in spite of being aware of the uncertainty existence, the common practices of planning tends to totally ignore it or consider it much less than it is deserved to be considered. Uh, and there are two practices which even enhance or increase the probability of not meeting the plan objectives and not being able to execute according to the plan. The first one is the level of details. 
it is common, very common for companies to have very detailed level of planning. So detailed, it is more detailed than the level of uncertainty they are planning into. I've seen plans where activities are actually planned in the level of minutes into the future. But if there is uncertainty, it's definitely higher than minutes. And what plan can actually be executed when it is planned in level of minutes into the future? And commonly, plans do not include visible, sufficient buffers to handle uncertainty. It is seen to be as a admission of incapability to execute and plan if we visibly introduce a buffer into the plan. As the result, immediately there is a plan made is by design doomed to fail. And uh, the lessons learned when the plan actually fails is that we did not plan good enough, so let's find a way to plan better. And it creates a reality where the plan by itself becomes the objective and not the objective of the plan. But the truth is, it's no plan. No plan, whatever detail or lack of, can eliminate or remove uncertainty. And the more detailed the plan is, the more sensitive it is to uncertainty. So the more detailed the plan is, the less likely it is to be uh, stable enough so you can actually execute to it. Then, when we go to executions, we expect people to operate according to the plan. Oftentimes, they are even measured on operating according to the plan. The fact that there is uncertainty guarantees that they will not be able to perform according to the plan. And what do you expect people to do in this case? How do you expect them to behave? What do you think will be the results of such behaviors when people are supposed to be working to a plan, they actually cannot work to it? Uh, Managers have really two key tasks they need to be aware of on an ongoing basis. The first one is they must make sure that the system achieves the goals, the goals that are set by the plan. And the second one is to make their system better, to improve the performance. The common practice of planning too detailed and not having buffers uh, is failing these two tasks because by design we will not be able to achieve the goals of the plan and because the plan is too detailed by design we will have too many places where we will need to focus our attention in order to try and to improve so the improvement efforts will be spread on too many areas not allowing us to focus on those areas where the magnitude of the improvement that is achievable is significant an alternative approach is to start with a plan which is good enough, not too detailed, not, not detailed enough, uh, kind of trying to build a plan that it is clear that within the horizon of the plan, it is very unlikely that the plan itself will need to change, even when Murphy does happen and Murphy events will happen. The second part is to include visible buffers only where needed. What are buffers? They are a protective mechanism against common and expected uncertainty. It's a way to say we things that we do not expect that affect the ability to deliver the results planned will happen in the future. Let's build some protection against it. Visible means it is formally a part of the plan, so everyone is aware of it, why it is there, and how they can use it. By inserting buffers, we convert a plan to be much more realistic and much higher probability of attaining its objective. And luckily, it also creates an infrastructure for the two critical managerial tasks. Uh, when we go to execution, it allows the people that execute to have the flexibility to take actions not by the plan, but by what is needed to ensure that we meet the plan objectives. It sets clear priorities to everyone according to the remaining safety in the buffers, and it creates a clear identification of where improvements and effort are needed. So about the concept of buffers. In theory of constraints, we place buffers in our plans 
but only in critical points. Critical points are points where if there will be no buffer, the probability of missing the plane is very high. So it is clear and there are practices and we will go through them in other sessions, how to design and introduce buffers into planes by the separate type of planes. Uh, in any plane, uh, uh, there are normally very few points where buffers are required. The only uh, difference would be in stock management where actually every SKU in every location will need to have a buffer. Some of the more common types of buffers are buffers of time, of stock, buffers of capacity, cache, buffer of leads in the entrance to the sales process. These are types of buffers that helps us protect against Murphy. How do we use buffers? Uh, we use buffers by basically understanding that uh, we allow uncertainty to consume the buffer. So not every event of uncertainty requires a reaction from the management. It can consume of the buffer. The buffer is there, is there to, be, to protect and to be consumed. However, as the buffer is consumed, we can monitor the rate of its consumption and we can monitor how much safety is still left within the buffer. By these two uh, numbers, we can identify how risky the situation becomes and identify the right point of time where there is a need for a managerial intervention. So instead of going to all kind of analyses and uh, uh, sophisticated statistical analysis. We are focusing on what is going on. We are allowing the flexibility of execution and we are identifying the right time to have a managerial intervention by the level of safety which we still have so that when we take the intervention, we still have enough time to effectively affect the completion of the plan according to uh, its objectives. Buffers are normally split into five zones. Uh, we are coloring them. We have a blue zone that says that we have way too much that is required and therefore the action required is do nothing until the buffer shrinks to the, uh, to the size that is uh, reasonable and required. Green indicates there is enough and it calls for operations as usual, no specific uh, requirement. Yellow is just about right, saying, okay, don't do anything yet, just be aware. Red means that we are entering into a risky zone, so we should do some type of expediting activities. Black means, hey, we already missed our objective on that specific part of the plan, and we need to take some extreme measures to go back into um, the targets or the framework we would like. These colors also provide a clear priority system as everyone in the system can adhere to them knowing that if something is black, it's more important than red. If it's red, it's more important than yellow, etc. It is true for anyone in the system, so it creates a clear set of priorities. And because it is linked to the objectives of the plan, everybody also can understand that by adhering to these priorities, they are doing the right thing for the system as a whole. So we have clear priorities, everybody understands them, and knows how to follow them accordingly. In addition, whenever the buffer, any buffer turns red, we can document the specific event and then do once in a period a statistical analysis of this event as a means of focusing our improvement efforts. Using the buffers under theory of constraints is called buffer management. Again, we'll take different examples and different plans as we dive into other parts of the theory of constraints body of knowledge. What are the values of buffer management? The first one is the clarity of priorities. So many organizations are struggling with priorities and eventually the common practice is that priority is set by uh, two criteria mostly. One is uh, the level or the uh, uh, strength of the shout. And the second is who is shouting. So a CEO needs to shout in a lower voice to get a task he would like in priority rather than a line manager. But oftentimes, priorities are just a tag of war. People are fighting about what is important, what is not, because there is no clear reason to understand why is something important. 
Um, we also have a system in the buffer management that enables us to identify when and how much we need to modify the buffer size so that it will enable the continuous improvement. Uh, we can identify if any resource or any part of the process becomes consistently problematic and focus attention on improving that. Um, it improves dramatically the effectiveness of performance improvement initiatives because we are focusing on the limited places where these improvements are really required. It becomes a very practical, practical link between planning and execution. So it converts uh, all the chaos of irrelevant planning into sufficiently good planning and shift the focus, and this is in my eyes one of the critical effects of buffer management, it shifts the focus from planning to execution. We can achieve the goals of the system not by planning, only by execution. So business summary, business planning is about the future. Future contains uncertainty, this is not a surprise. We should have plans which are not more accurate than the level of uncertainty of the planning horizon. We know Melfi exists, we cannot ignore it. It's not a prudent way to plan and execute. Acknowledging Melfi mandates adding visible and sufficient buffers in the right places, the right size, in the plan. While we add them, they convert the function of planning, they shift the focus to execution, and they enable us to have a very high level of execution accuracy, to have clear priorities for everyone, and to uh, have extremely effective improvement efforts. This is now for buffers. We will talk more about them in each one of the execution practices of theory of constraints. Thank you for being with us. Bye-bye.